only the dead-looking evergreen firs dotted about in the forest, and this oak, refused to yield to the charm of spring or notice either the spring or the sunshine. Spring, love, happiness, this oak seemed to say. Are you not wary of that stupid, meaningless, constantly repeated fraud? Always the same and always a fraud. There is no spring, no sun. Under the oak, too, were flowers and grass, but it stood among them scowling, rigid, misshapen, and grim as ever. Yes, the oak is right, a thousand times right, thought Prince Andrew. Let others, the young, yield afresh to that fraud. But we know life. Our life is finished. A whole sequence of new thoughts, hopeless but mournfully pleasant, rose in his soul. In During this journey he, as it were, considered his life afresh and arrived at his old conclusion, restful in its hopelessness, that it was not for him to begin anything anew, but that he must live out his Chapter I. Prince Andrew had to see the marshal of the nobility for the district in connection with the affairs of the Ryazan estate of which he was trustee. This marshal was Count Ilya Rostov, and in the middle of May Prince Andrew went to visit him. It was now hot spring weather. The whole forest was already clothed in green. It was dusty and so hot that on passing near water one longed to bath. Prince Andrew, depressed and preoccupied with the business about which he had to speak to the marshal, was driving up the avenue in the grounds of the Rostov's house at Otrad now. He heard merry girlish cries behind some trees on the right and saw a group of girls running to cross the path of his college. Ahead of the rest and nearer to him ran a dark-haired, remarkably slim, pretty girl in a yellow chintz dress with a white handkerchief on her head from under which loose locks of hair escaped. The girl was shouting something but, seeing that he was a stranger, ran back laughing without looking at him. Suddenly, he did not know why, he felt a pain. The day was so beautiful, the sun so bright, everything around so gay, but that slim pretty girl did not know, or wish to know, of his existence and was contented and cheerful. What is she so glad about? What is she thinking of? not of the military regulations or of the arrangement of the riots and serfs' quitrants. Of what is she thinking? Why is she so happy? Prince Andrew asked himself with instinctive curiosity. In 1809 Count Ilya Rostov was living at Otradno just as he had done in former years, that is, entertaining almost the whole province with hunts, theatricals, dinners. He was glad to see Prince Andrew, as he was to see any new visitor, and insisted on his staying the night. During the dull day, in the course of which he was entertained by his elderly hosts, and by the more important of the visitors, the old count's house was crowded on account of an approaching name day. He read a while and then put out his candle, but relit it. It was hot in the room, the inside shutters of which were closed. He was cross with the stupid old man, as he called Rostov, who had made him stay by assuring him that some necessary documents had not yet arrived from town, and he was vexed with himself. He got up and went to the window to open it. As soon as he opened the shutters, the moonlight, as if it had long been watching for this, burst into the room. He opened the casement. The night was fresh, bright, and very still. Just before the window was a row of pollard trees, looking black on one side and with a silvery light on the other. Beneath the trees grew some kind of lush, wet, bushy vegetation with silver-lit leaves and stems here and there. Farther back beyond the dark trees a roof glittered with dew. To the right was a leafy tree with brilliantly white trunk and branches, and above it shone the moon, nearly at its full, in a pair. Prince Andrew leaned his elbows on the window ledge and his eyes rested on that sky, his room was on the first floor. Those in the rooms above were also awake. He heard female voices overhead. Just once more, said a girlish voice above him which Prince Andrew recognized at once. But when are you coming to bed? replied another voice. I want. I can't sleep. What's the use? Come now for the last time. Two girlish voices sang a musical passage, the end of some song. Oh, how lovely! Now go to sleep, and there's an end of it. You go to sleep, 
but I can't, said the first voice, coming nearer to the window. She was evidently leaning right out, for the rustle of her dress and even her breathing could be heard. Everything was stone still, like the moon and its light and the shadows. Prince Andrew, too, dared not stir, for fear of betraying his unintentional presence. Sonia, Sonia, he again heard the first speaker. Oh, how can you sleep? Only look how glorious it is. Ah, uh, how glorious. Do wake up, Sonia, she said almost with tears in her voice. There never, never was such a lovely night before. Sonia made some reluctant reply. Do just come and see what a moon. Come and see what a moon. And see we we oh how lovely come here oh how how darling sweetheart come here there you see I feel like sitting down on my heels putting my arms round my knees like this straining tight as tight all right go go again all was silent but Prince Andrew knew she was still sitting there. From time to time he heard a soft rustle and at times a sigh. Oh God, oh God, what does it mean? She suddenly exclaimed, To bed then, if it must be. And she slammed at the casement. For her I might as well not exist, thought Prince Andrew while he listened to her voice, for some reason expecting yet fearing that she might say something about him. There she is again, as if it were on purpose, thought he. In his soul there suddenly arose such an unexpected turmoil of youthful thoughts and hopes, contrary to the whole tenor of his life, that unable to explain his condition to himself he lay. Chapter I and next morning, having taken leave of no one but the Count, and not waiting for the ladies to appear, Prince Andrew set off for home. It was already the beginning of June when on his return journey he drove into the birch forest where the gnarled old oak had made so strange and memorable an impression on him. In the forest the harness bells sounded yet more muffled than they had done six weeks before, for now all was thick, shady and dense, and the young firs dotted about in the forest did not. The whole day had been hot. Somewhere a storm was gathering, but only a small cloud had scattered some raindrops lightly, sprinkling the road and the sappy leaves. The left side of the forest was dark in the shade, the right side glittered in the sunlight, wet and shiny and scarcely swayed by the breeze. Everything was in blossom. The nightingales trilled, and their voices reverberated now near, now far away. Yes, here in this forest was that oak with which I agreed, thought Prince Andrew. But where is it, he again wondered, gazing at the left side of the road, and without recognizing it he looked with admiration at the very oak he sought. The old oak, quite transfigured, spreading out a canopy of sappy dark green foliage, stood wrapped and slightly trembling in the rays of the evening sun. Neither gnarled fingers nor old scars nor old doubts and sorrows were any of them in evidence now. Through the hard century-old bark, even where there were no twigs, Leaves had sprouted such as one could hardly believe the old veteran could have produced. Yes, it is the same oak, thought Prince Andrew, and all at once he was seized by an unreasoning springtime feeling of joy and renewal. All the best moments of his life suddenly rose to his memory. Austerlitz with the lofty heavens, his wife's dead reproachful face, peer at the ferry that girl thrilled by the beauty of the night and that night itself and the moon, and all this rushed suddenly to his mind. No, life is not over at thirty-one, Prince Andrew suddenly decided finally and decisively. It is not enough for me to know what I have in me. Everyone must know it, Pierre, and that young girl who wanted to fly away into the sky. Everyone must know me so that my life a whole series of sensible and logical considerations showing it to be essential for him to go to Petersburg, and even to re-enter the service, kept springing up in his mind. He could not now understand how he could ever even have doubted the necessity of taking an active share in life, just as a month before he had not understood how the idea of leaving the quiet country could ever... 
It now seemed clear to him that all his experience of life must be senselessly wasted unless he applied it to some kind of work and again played an active part in life. He did not even remember how formerly, on the strength of similar wretched logical arguments, it had seemed obvious that he would be degrading himself if he now, after the lessons he had had in life, now reason suggested quite the opposite. After that journey to Ryazan he found the country dull. His former pursuits no longer interested him, and often when sitting alone in his study he got up, went to the mirror, and then he would turn away to the portrait of his dead lines, who with hair curled a love wreck looked tenderly and gaily at him out of the gilt frame. She did not now say those former terrible words to him, but looked simply, merrily, and inquisitively at him, and Prince Andrew, crossing his arms behind him, long paced the room, now frowning, now smiling, as he reflected on those irrational, inexpressible thoughts, and if any one came into his room at such moments he was particularly cold, stern, and above all unpleasantly logical. My dear Princess Mary entering at such a moment would say, Little Nicholas can't go out today, it's very cold. If it were hot, Prince Andrew would reply at such that is what follows from the fact that it is cold, and not that a child who needs fresh air should remain at home. He would add with extreme logic, as if punishing someone for those secret illogic. At such moments Princess Mary would think how intellectual work dries men up. Chapter If Prince Andrew arrived in Petersburg in August, 1809. It was the time when the youthful Spurinsky was at the zenith of his fame and his reforms were being pushed forward with the greatest energy. That same August the emperor was thrown from his kalachi, injured his leg, and remained three weeks at Peterhof, receiving Spurinsky every day and no one else. At that time the two famous decrees were being prepared that so agitated society abolishing court ranks and introducing examinations to qualify for the grades of collegiate assessor and state captain. Now those vague liberal dreams with which the Emperor Alexander had ascended the throne, and which he had tried to put into effect with the aid of his associates, Sartorisky, Novozil, now all these men were replaced by Sperensky on the civil side, and Arakchev on the military. Soon after his arrival, Prince Andrew, as a gentleman of the chamber, presented himself at court and at a levy. The emperor, though he met him twice, did not favor him with a single word. It had always seemed to Prince Andrew before that he was antipathetic to the emperor, and that the latter disliked his face and personality generally, and in the cold, repellent glance the emperor the courtiers explained the emperor's neglect of him by his majesty's displeasure at Balkanska's not having served since 1805. I know myself that one cannot help one's sympathies and antipathies, thought Prince Andrew, so it will not do to present my proposal for the reform of the army regulations to the emperor personally. The field marshal made an appointment to see him, received him graciously, and promised to inform the emperor. A few days later Prince Andrew received notice that he was to go to see the Minister of War, Count Arakchev. On the appointed day Prince Andrew entered Count Arakchev's waiting room at nine in the morning. He did not know Arakchev personally, had never seen him, and all he had heard of him inspired him with but little respect for the man. He is Minister of War, a man trusted by the Emperor, and I need not concern myself about his personal qualities. He has been commissioned to consider my project, so during his service, chiefly as an adjutant, Prince Andrew had seen the anterooms of many important men, and the different types of such rooms were well known to him. Count Arakchev's anteroom had quite a special character. The faces of the unimportant people awaiting their turn for an audience showed embarrassment and servility. The faces of those of higher rank expressed a common feeling of awkwardness, covered by a some walked thoughtfully up and down, others whispered and laughed. Prince Andrew heard the nickname Sila and Drevich and the words, Uncle will give it to us hot, in reference to Count Arakchev. One general, an important personage, evidently feeling offended at having to wait so long, 
sat crossing and uncrossing his legs and smiling contemptuously to himself. But the moment the door opened, one feeling alone appeared on all faces, that of fear. Prince Andrew, for the second time, asked the adjutant on duty to take in his name, but received an ironical look and was told that his turn would come in due course. After some others had been shown in and out of the minister's room by the adjutant on duty, an officer who struck Prince Andrew by his humiliated and frightened air was admitted at that terrible door. This officer's audience lasted a long time. Then suddenly the grating sound of a harsh voice was heard from the other side of the door, and the officer, with pale face and trembling lips, came out and passed through the waiting room, clutched. After this prince, Andrew was conducted to the door, and the officer on duty said in a whisper, to the right, at the window. Prince Andrew entered a plain tidy room, and saw at the table. A rack chief turned his head toward him without looking at him. What is your petition? asked a rack chief. I am not petitioning. Your Excellency, returned Prince Andrew quietly. A rack chief's eyes turned toward him. Sit down, said he. Prince Balkansky, I am not petitioning about anything. His Majesty the Emperor has deigned to send Your Excellency a project submitted by me. You see, my dear sir, I have read your project, interrupted Arakshiv, uttering only, You are proposing new military laws. There are many laws, but no one to carry out the old ones. Nowadays everybody designs laws. It is easier writing than doing. I came at His Majesty the Emperor's wish to learn from Your Excellency how you propose to deal with the memorandum I have presented. I have endorsed a resolution on your memorandum and sent it to the committee. I do not approve of it, said Arakshiv, rising and taking a paper from his writing table. Here, and he handed it to Prince Andrew. Across the paper was scrawled in pencil, without capital letters, misspelled, and without punctuation. Unsoundly constructed because resembles an imitation of the French military to the Committee on Army Regulations, and I have recommended that your honor should be appointed a member, but without a salary. Prince Andrew smiled. I don't want one. A member without salary, repeated Arakshiv. I have the honor. He called the next one. Who else is there? He shouted, bowing to Prince Andrew. Chapter V. While waiting for the announcement of his appointment to the committee, Prince Andrew looked up his former acquaintances, particularly those he knew to be in power and whose aid he might need. In Petersburg he now experienced the same feeling he had had on the eve of a battle, when troubled by anxious curiosity, and irresistibly attracted to the ruling circles where the future, from the irritation of the older men, the curiosity of the uninitiated, the reserve of the initiated, the hurry and preoccupation of every one, and the innumerable committees and committees, and this movement of reconstruction of which Prince Andrew had a vague idea, and Spurinsky, its chief promoter, began to interest him so keenly that the question of the army regulations quickly received. Prince Andrew was most favorably placed to secure good reception in the highest and most diverse Petersburg circles of the day. The reforming party cordially welcomed and courted him, in the first place because he was reputed to be clever and very well read, and secondly because by liberating his serfs he had obtained the reputation of the party of the old and dissatisfied who censured the innovations, turned to him expecting his sympathy in their disapproval of the reforms, simply because he was the son of his father. The feminine society world welcomed him gladly because he was rich, distinguished, a good match, and almost a newcomer, with a hallow of romance on account of his supposed death and the tragic law. Besides this, the general opinion of all who had known him previously was that he had greatly improved during these last five years, having softened and grown more manly, lost his former People talked about him, were interested in him, and wanted to meet him. The day after his interview with Count Arakchev, Prince Andrew spent the evening at Count Kakuvi's. He told the Count of his interview with Silo Andreevich, Kakuvi spoke of Arakchev by that nickname with the same vague irony Prince Andrew had noticed in the Minister of War's anteroom. Monsieur, even in this case you can't do without Michael Mikhailovich Spurinska. He manages everything. I'll speak to him. 
He has promised to come this evening. What has Speranska to do with the army regulations? asked Prince Andrew. Kakubi shook his head smilingly, as if surprised at Bolkonska's simplicity. We were talking to him about you a few days ago, Kakubi continued, and about your freed plowmen. Oh, is it you, Prince, who have freed your serfs? said an It was a small estate that brought in no profit, replied Prince Andrew, trying to extenuate his actions so as not to irritate the old man uselessly. Afraid of being late, said the old man, looking at Kakubi. There's one thing I don't understand, he continued. Who will plow the land if they are set free? It is easy to write laws, but difficult to rule. But did il il li il il li do you? Just the same as now I ask you, Count, who will be heads of the departments when everybody has to pass examinations. Those who pass the examinations, I suppose, replied Kakubi. Cross well, I have Prianic Nick of serving under me, a splendid man, a priceless man, but he's sixty. Is he to go up for examination? Yes, that's a difficulty, as education is not at all general, but Count Kakubi did not finish. He rose, took Prince Andrew by the arm, and went to meet a tall, bald, fair man of about forty with a large open forehead and a long face of unusual and peculiar whiteness. The newcomer wore a blue swallowtail coat with a cross suspended from his neck and a star on his left breast. It was Speranska. Prince Andrew recognized him at once and felt a throb within him, as happens at critical moments of life. Whether it was from respect, envy, or anticipation, he did not know. Speranska's whole figure was of a peculiar type that made him easily recognizable. In the society in which Prince Andrew lived he had never seen anyone who together with awkward and clumsy gestures possessed such calmness and self-assurance. He had never seen so resolute yet gentle. Such whiteness and softness Prince Andrew had only seen on the faces of soldiers who had been long in hospital. This was Speransky, Secretary of State, reporter to the Emperor and his companion at Erfurt, where he had more than once met and talked with Napoleon. Speransky did not shift his eyes from one face to another as people involuntarily do on entering a large company and was in no hurry to speak. He spoke slowly, with assurance that he would be listened to, and he looked only at the person with whom he was conversing. Prince Andrew followed Speransky's every word and movement with particular attention, as happens to some people, especially to men who judge those near to them severely, he always on meeting anyone new, especially anyone whom, like Speranska, he knew by Speranska told Kakubi he was sorry he had been unable to come sooner, as he had been detained at the palace. He did not say that the emperor had kept him, and Prince Andrew noticed this affectation of modesty. When Kakubi introduced Prince Andrew, Speranska slowly turned his eyes to Balkanska with his customary smile and looked at him in silence. I am very glad to make your acquaintance. I had heard of you, as everyone has, he said after a pause. Kakubi said a few words about the reception Arakchev had given Bolkonsky. Speransky smiled more markedly. The chairman of the Committee on Army Regulations is my good friend Monsieur Magnitsky, he said, fully articulating every word and syllable, and if you like I can put you in touch with him. I hope you will find him sympathetic and ready to cooperate in promoting all that is reasonable. A circle soon formed round Speransky, and the old man who had talked about his subordinate Prianic Prince Andrew, without joining in the conversation, watched every movement of Speransky's. This man, not long since an insignificant divinity student, who now Balkanska thought, Prince Andrew was struck by the extraordinarily disdainful composure with which Speransky answered the old man. He appeared to address condescending words to him from an immeasurable height. When the old man began to speak too loud, Speransky smiled and said he could not judge of the advantage or disadvantage of what pleased the sovereign. Having talked for a little while in the general circle, Speransky arose and coming up to Prince Andrew took him along to the other end of the room. 
it was clear that he thought it necessary to interest himself in Balkanska. I had no chance to talk with you, Prince, during the animated conversation in which that venerable gentleman involved me, he said with a mildly contemptuous smile, as if intimating by that this flattered Prince Andrew. I have known of you for a long time. First from your action with regard to your serfs, a first example, of which it is very desirable, that there should be more imitation. I began the service from the lower grade. Your father, a man of the last century, evidently stands above our contemporaries who so condemned this measure which merely re-established. He did not like to agree with him in everything and felt a wish to contradict. Though he usually spoke easily and well, he felt a difficulty in expressing himself now while talking with Sperinska. He was too much absorbed in observing the famous man's personality. Grounds of personal ambition may be Sperinsky put in quietly, and of state interest to some extent, said Prince Andrew. What do you mean? asked Sperinsky quietly, lowering his eyes. I am an admirer of Montesquieu, replied Prince Andrew, and his idea that le principe des monarchies est l'honneur parade incontestable. Certain droits at privileges de la noblesse me paraissent and etter des moyens de soutenir ce sentiment. The principle of monarchies is honor seems to me incontestable. Certain rights and privileges for the aristocracy appear to me a means of maintaining that sentiment. The smile vanished from Sperinsky's white face, which was much improved by the change. Probably Prince Andrew's thought interested him. Sivas envisages la question sous c point de vue. He began pronouncing French with evident difficulty, and speaking even slower than in Russian but quite calmly. If you regard the question from that point of view, Speransky went on to say that honor, a honor, cannot be upheld by privileges harmful to the service. That honor, his arguments were concise, simple, and clear. An institution of holding honor, the source of emulation, is one similar to the Legion d'Honneur of the great Emperor Napoleon, not harmful but helpful to the success of the service. Every courtier considers himself bound to maintain his position worthily. Yet you do not care to avail yourself of the privilege, Prince, said Speransky, indicating by a smile that if you will do me the honor of calling on me on Wednesday, he added, I will, after talking with Magnitsky, let you know what may interest you, and shall also have the pleasure of a more detailed chapter by during the first weeks of his stay in Petersburg, Prince Andrew felt the whole trend of thought he had formed during his life of seclusion quite overshadowed by the trifling cares that engrossed him in that city. On returning home in the evening, he would jot down in his notebook four or five necessary calls or appointments for certain hours. The mechanism of life, the arrangement of the day so as to be in time everywhere, absorbed the greater part of his vital energy. He did nothing, did not even think or find time to think, but only talked, and talked successfully, of what he had thought while in the country. He sometimes noticed with dissatisfaction that he repeated the same remark on the same day in different circles. But he was so busy for whole days together that he had no time to notice that he was thinking of nothing. As he had done on their first meeting at Kakubi's, Speranska produced a strong impression on Prince Andrew on the Wednesday, when he received him tete-a-tete at his own house and talked to him long and to Balkanskaya so many people appeared contemptible and insignificant creatures, and he so longed to find in someone the living ideal of that perfection toward which he strove, that he readily believed. Had Speranska sprung from the same class as himself and possessed the same breeding and traditions, Volkanska would soon have discovered his weak, human, unheroic sides, but as it was, moreover, Speransky, either because he appreciated the other's capacity or because he considered it necessary to win him to his side, showed off his dispassionate calm reasonableness before Prince. During their long conversation on Wednesday evening, Speransky more than once remarked, We regard everything that is above the common level of rooted custom, or, with a smile, he saw in him a remarkable, clear-thinking man of vast intellect who by his energy and persistence had attained power, which he was using solely for the welfare of Russia. 
in prince andrew's eyes speranskaya was the man he would himself have wished to be one who explained all the facts of life reasonably considered important only what was rational and was everything seemed so simple and clear in speranskaya's exposition that prince andrew involuntarily agreed with him about everything